good morning. It is good to be with you today. Welcome. I used to be more in tune with what was going on as a teacher, but again, it's just weird, the timing of, it's summer. Um, and for many of you, I know you might still have a week left of school or, or so, but be praying um, for those in there, but excited for summer's end. I know the teachers are um, excited for the rest, and you made it through another year. Um, let me put this on so it actually picks up. There we go. But again, um, also congratulations to those that are graduating and promoting into the next grades. Um, be praying for them, uh, especially those that are seniors that have graduated as they move on to the next phase um, in, their, in their life. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, just f- that God would protect them and watch over them as they, they enter into, some of them still may be at home, maybe for a little too long, but but they're really entering into this place where they're not necessarily protected anymore by, by just the covering of their parents or their upbringing, and they're, they're moving out. Um, so just be praying for them. Um, also, let's just go ahead and start in prayer. Thank you. <laughs> and just get me focused. Um, let's join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord. As we just sang, you deserve it all. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. Worthy of our praise. Father God, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the love that held him to the cross. And for the power over death. And the hope that we have from his resurrection, Lord, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for what we celebrated last week in Pentecost and just continue to celebrate the presence of of your spirit within us here as a church and individually as your believers, Lord, as your children. I pray that your spirit would be at work today, continue to be at work. Lord, as we continue to worship in word, I pray that your spirit would open up our hearts and our minds to understand the deep truths, Lord, that lie within Lord, that you would make your word live to us. I pray that if there's any distractions that we have right now, Lord, that we would lay it at your feet. Lord, that we would cast our cares upon you. Lord, we do lift up those again that are graduating. Lord, we we ask that you would just go with them, protect them, Lord, in their, their next season of life, Lord, whatever they may be entering into, whether the workforce or schooling or whatever that may be, military. I pray, Lord, that you would just watch over them, that you would guide their steps, Lord, that they would be able to recall the things that they've learned as they were being brought up, Lord, and that they would cling to you. Lord, that their faith would belong to them. Lord, we lift up those that are, where school is their safe place. Lord, I pray that over the summer that you would put a hedge of protection around them. Lord, that you would bring peace to their home. That you would watch over them, Lord. Lord, and that their, their family would come to know you. That you would heal and restore. Lord, we pray for those that are mourning today, Lord, and those that are suffering. Pray that you would just wrap your arms around them, comfort them. Lord, I pray for those that are just struggling with illness, Lord, that you again would heal, that you would bring strength and rest. I pray, Lord, that you would just, um, your healing hand would be upon them, Lord, that you would give them hope. And that you would restore their bodies, Lord. Lord, we love you. Lord, I ask that you would just again, just take charge right now, Lord. That you would have your way in this time together. Lord, that we would honor you. And that you would receive all the glory. Have your way now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, we're going to continue on in our study in Mark today. Um, Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 34, roughly, if you would stand as we read God's word. Follow along here. And he was saying to them, A lamp is not brought in to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, Take care that you listen to, or what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him shall, more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. And he was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts, to the, or puts in the sickle, Because the harvest has come. And he said, How shall we picture the kingdom of God, and by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it, and he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, we again just pray that you would be with our time right now. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Once again... We are picking up here in Mark. We just finished with the parable of the sower. 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 Um, Sorry, I mixed the two up because it's not just the soil or soil. Yeah, let me start over. It's not the sower that is really what the parable is about. It's the soils is the difference, right? So it's really the parable of the soils, and we look at the sower, but the sower is planting what? A seed. What's the seed? The Word of God. So we have the privilege of having that one explained to us, right? It said the seed is the word of God, the soil is the heart of the people, and it was the condition of the heart, the seed. Now again, remember, was the seed different? No, it was the same seed planted in each type of soil. And was the sower picky, I guess, or discriminatory in how he sowed? No. He cast the seed everywhere. He was very generous with his sowing, right? He, he cast the seed wherever it may go. He did not keep the word of God from anyone. He, he spread the seed to everyone, and whoever the, whatever the condition of the soil was depended on how this, the seed was taken in. And the seed was taken in, And some of it had growth, but how many actually were successful? Just one type, the good soil, right? So the, as far as types go, there was a 75% failure rate with the sowing. There was 25% success. Now, not proportionally. We don't necessarily know how much is good soil and how much was on the rocky pathway. Um, obviously, I hope your garden is not equally pathway thorny area or stone weeds and good soil because that would not make it for a good garden right so hopefully there was more sown in a better area but again as far as the types it was a 25 percent success in that area now again hopefully there was more sown in the good soil but what what that was doing with us here it had two points with the parables we we talked about parables being a word that is meaning to throw alongside. It's to take a everyday truth and a spiritual truth and throw it alongside with each other, something that would help them understand a daily truth 
to understand a deeper spiritual truth that would not necessarily be otherwise understood. However, there's a caveat. Sometimes the parable is meant to reveal. Sometimes it is meant to conceal. And I believe that it's an act of grace and mercy to conceal the truth from those that are not ready to hear it. You hear that? If they're not yet ready to hear the truth, then God's grace keeps them from being able to understand it so they're not responsible for it. Because once they hear the truth and understand the full truth and have understanding of it, and they deny God, woe. Woe to them. Where the truth is understood and they deny. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit is revealing the truth to them completely and they're saying no. That's not a good thing. It is God's mercy that conceals that until they are ready. Until they're able to have that understanding or be exposed to the truth fully. Now we don't know what the types of soil it is. So we're, our job is to do what? So. We are, we are, our job is to plant. We don't know the condition of the soil. We could try to help along, but again, that's really the work of the Holy Spirit is to prep the soil. Um, we could pray. And again, don't est- underestimate the power of prayer. And as a, an example for those, again, as parents, don't stop praying. Keep praying. And the soil, the thorns, the weeds could be weeded out. The soil could be tilled up, um, watered, softened. And you never know when it's going to take root. So the purpose of this, this parable here is, one, to evoke a response. What are you going to do with the seed, the word of God? And it exposes us. It exposes the condition of our hearts. What are we doing with that? So one of the things that we are called to do, again, as our response, is to keep sowing. When we feel just this pressure or just there's overwhelmed with the, the 75% failure rate, uh, we are just getting weary of we keep sowing and we keep talking about God, we keep sharing the gospel and... There's no fruit. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. Keep praying. Keep, keep presenting the, the gospel. Keep at it. But also, again, exposing us to really look at what, what's going on in our own hearts is, are we the good soil? And it's okay to say, yes, you're the good soil. Being good soil does not mean you're perfect. Being good soil means that you are ready to receive the seed and to do something with it. It's still being mended. It's still being processed. It still needs water. It still needs fertilizer. It still needs all these things, but it was able to receive. Now, again, having that seed or good soil, being good soil, has nothing to do with you being a good person. It's everything to do with the work of the Holy Spirit. You're not in a certain position or a place in life or, or a station in life or anything like that where you are qualified to be good soil and the person next to you isn't. It's not something the Lord over other people is saying, hey, I'm good dirt. <laughs> You're still dirt. We all are. But God breathes life into that dirt. No place to boast but the glory of God. So that's what the parable of the sower was on the soils. So we're going to continue on here with the next three parables are, are looking at how to explain the kingdom of God in this way. He's talking to his disciples again and actually talking to a bit of the crowd as well. And he goes on to say here, and they're, they're a little confused, again, on these parables. 
And he says, and he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put under a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except for, or to be revealed, nor has anything been secret but that which has come to light. you got to put yourself in the perspective of the disciples here for a moment. They're kind of confused on what's going on. Have you ever been confused by what God's doing? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of think about Elijah and Moses when I think about this. Think about Elijah, 1 Kings 19-ish in that area. Do you guys remember what Elijah was somewhat famous for? The going up against 450 prophets of Baal. Taunting him, right? Dug a trench around the altar or the sacrifice and poured water, doused it with water over and over and over again. And the prophets prayed and for all day at least, I don't know if it was multiple days, but at least all day, praying and doing all, and, and Elijah just kept saying, oh, maybe he's on the toilet. Um, or, so that's all I remembered as a young guy. Um, but basically just saying, oh, you know, and then one prayer, a simple prayer, Elijah prays to God and it consumes, the sacrifice. it just lights in fire and it's drenched with water. Now, after that, you're thinking Elijah probably has, this is a good place for a revival. Like, clearly, everyone has had to see what God just did. They all should be wanting to follow the one true God now. But we find in chapter 19 that who's after him? Queen Jezebel. There's a warrant out for his life. And he runs... And he's on this high from this thing, and then all of a sudden he's running and hiding and trying, and then he finds himself praying a prayer that's just kind of like, we see it from, you know, bird's eye view kind of thing. But he's praying going, I'm all alone. You did this and you left me all alone. Just take my life now. And he's saying, But God had something different. He was confused on what God was doing, right? And God answered him, basically saying, you are so prideful. (laughs) You are not the only one that there's a remnant. I kept the remnant of people that believe in me and follow after me to go this way, right? So there's this process of starting with what God is doing, seeing the hopes of a future kingdom to come, and this revival of God just taking taking on the, these um, other empires and different things, conquering them, and then just kind of being confused on, God, what are you doing? We just had this high. And now no one is remembering this. No one's remembering what you did, and they're just remembering, she's after me. And then Moses, what happened with Moses? Well, several things, but we'll focus on one thing in Numbers Um, Chapter 11. So Moses just helped get the Israelites out of Egypt. They're going, they're walking through Egypt, and they're grumbling. So what does God do? Provides manna. What is it? Exactly. Manna. They didn't know what it was, right? Some substance that was edible. Some people call it bread, but it was the manna of life that was provided from God, from heaven above, to provide for their daily needs everything that they needed. They didn't have to collect it. It just dropped on them. Actually, if they collect it too much, it molded, right? They just had to take whatever was necessary for that day, and that was it. And we find them just grumbling about this is all we have to eat. We had it better in, um, in Egypt. We could eat all we want at no cost to us. God's like, no cost to you. 
you're, you seem to forget. What, and often we do that, right? When things get hard, even though we're going the right direction, it gets difficult. We remember how easy it was over here in the bad place, but it was easier, even though we were actually drowning in it. We don't remember that stuff. We just remember the, the moments of, oh, I had, I had all I wanted. And he eventually provides quail and quail to provide that and then keeps going. But Moses, again, is saying he's confused about what God is doing. You did something great. You took him out of Egypt. Here we are. You're covering and providing for us this manna. And they're still grumbling. They're still taking up. They want to basically kill Moses at this time and just send him back to um, or go all back to Egypt. And he's wondering, what is going on? And it's kind of what the disciples are at right here saying, hey, we're... If you read in, in other parts of the gospel as well, it's pretty obvious. The disciples were expecting the kingdom just around the corner. They're expecting the team, kingdom of God to come soon, very soon. And they're probably really confused right now going, we're making some progress. We just had so many people following after you that you had to carry a boat around just in case you had to escape onto the boat to not get crushed by the crowd. But then your family came and basically said you were crazy. You denied knowing them or who are they? And they're trying to figure out what is going on here. We're expecting this kingdom, but right now all we see are us. And is this it? Is this all that there is? Is this the, what, what you have planned for your kingdom? The 12 of us? Because even in scripture, and I'm not saying just right here in this passage, but overall in the gospel you'll see that the numbers kind of grow and dwindle and as the gospel be, gets presented more and more, it's harder to take in. And when they take it in, it's harder, or when they hear it, it's hard to receive and many I believe it says in John that many left. That after he said some things, they heard him speak and many stopped following him. And we talked about that before with the, the book of Not a Fan where Kyle Eidemann kind of talks about any time that Jesus had a crowd, he kind of tried to narrow it narrowed it. He tried to weed out those that were there for the, the free food, right? The free lunch. He was saying, he, he was pretty audacious in what he said. After he fed the 5,000, the next day they came for breakfast and he says, here, you want to eat? Eat me. Which was just, I mean, to Jews, that was offensive. Saying to eat a human? That's dirty. It's unclean. To put yourself out there. But he was basically saying, hey, you, I gave you food, you're following me because I gave you food. But what you really need is me, but you're not willing to do it. Again, yes, Jesus speaks to the crowd, but he's not interested in the crowd. He's interested in those that are willing to count the cost and follow him. And so we see here again, how can he explain this parable, this lamp? Who is the lamp here? The lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? I can kind of picture Jesus with, you know, I think someone mentioned it earlier today, that Jesus has a sense of humor. I kind of see him with, as sitting there with some bunch of students, maybe in a class, of just asking these rhetorical questions where the students are like, laughing because it's kind of so obvious the answer that they're like no you don't do that oh yes you know type of thing where you're asking these questions do you bring a lamp in to be put under a basket no um and all those things but like or it's just rhetorical but the sense of jesus saying this is a such an obvious point that it would be ridiculous for you to do this if you have a lamp it needs to provide light if it's lit, there's no point in having it under the basket because you could just blow it out. However, again, who is the lamp? And, and really quickly, if you actually read this in other Gospels, they use a different word here. The article is a little bit different. This is a, this one specifically saying that this is 
a person or a specific article of um, here, the lamp. Not just a general one, but a specific one. Matthew and Luke say it a little bit differently, but here Mark is saying it's that the lamp, the light, Jesus is the lamp. Jesus did not come to be put under a basket. Or under a bed. Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? Of course it is. What does it say in the Gospels? Let your light shine before men. Right? We're to be what? A light on a hill. What's that light? Jesus. Was Jesus hidden a little bit? Initially. He was put under a basket for a little while, right? He spent 30 years in an obscure town of Nazareth growing up, learning, living his life with his family until he came out and was put on a lampstand in his ministry at 30 years old. And now it's time for what was hidden to be revealed. And that's what it says, right? And it keeps going here. It says, for nothing is hidden except or to be revealed. So if it was hidden, it's meant to be revealed. Nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. So it's saying here again that the light, the gospel, Jesus Christ himself, he is the light of the world. That Jesus has come and all treasures, all wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him. And he's revealing that now. He's taking his light. He's taking who he is, the creator of heaven and earth, of all the lights in, in the galaxies. And says it's not meant to be hidden. And we see it later on as that light being in us, that we have light in us, because who do we have within us? Jesus. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, we have him, God within us. We have his light within us. The way that we live our lives need to be in front of others to be seen, to point to, not us, as we just sang, who deserves all the glory? Jesus. We are to live our lives of in, before men, before others, to point to Jesus, to love others, to not hide that truth from others, to live it out, to not just bring it out on Sunday morning and put it back underneath the basket or underneath your bed all week. It's to put it out in front of others throughout the week, in your workplaces, in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your friendships, if whatever you do, in your social media post, whatever you're doing, put your light out in front of men. Not in a fake way. It's very obvious when it's manufactured. And you'll get called on it from people. They'll see it. They'll be like, uh, you post this, but I see your life... I see you doing this. People are watching. That's the point. People are watching you. Not by necessarily everything that you say, but, but what you do. If you call yourself a Christian, what is your light saying? What's the light pointing to? Can they see the real light in you, or is it some manufactured light? It's in there. And he's saying in here, again, the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to reveal it to us. So it says here, for nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that is, it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. For he was saying to them, take care that you listen, or what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And more will be given to you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. So again, remember, how was he teaching everyone? 
in parables. Verse 33 and 34, and then earlier in the chapter, it says, he kept teaching them in parables. He did not explain it to the crowd. He explained it to the, everything to his disciples. But again, to those that were with him, to those that had, more was given. There was a desire to learn more. There was a hunger for the truth. There was a desire to be drawn to the light. And the more they were drawn in, the more they received. The more that people denied it, it was taken from them. As Jesus lived his life out in ministry, the light was before man, and, they were, and he was exposing the truth to them for those that wanted to hear it and those that wanted to get it. They got more. For those that didn't want it, Jesus died on the cross, and to many, that was it. But to those that believed, what happened? More was given, and what did we get in the gift of the promise of the Holy Spirit, who was to do what? In John chapter 16, it tells us that there was much more for you to learn, but the disciples could not bear it right now, so that one day there will be sent a helper to explain all these things and have the Holy Spirit lead him into all truth. John chapter 16, verse 12 and 13, I believe. Looking at that, we see that the truth is within God. The more we desire it, the more we get. If we don't want it, it's going to be harder and harder to get it back. Does that make sense? It's kind of like fitness. If you want it, you actually keep, it's hard, but you keep desiring it. And more that you have, you have this goal, you have this health, fitness, whatever, and you get more. And you keep getting more, and you get more, and you eat more. And the moment that you deny that, trust me, the moment that you deny that, it is hard to turn around and try to hunger after it again. Because I remembered what it was like in Egypt. Because is it easy to not work out? Absolutely. Even though I forgot the penalty of it, in the moment, it's so much easier to do this. But the gain on this side is so much better. And you see this just taken away and it's going. And he says, listen. What is our response here is to listen. And this listening again, remember, it was an active faith. Hyper hearing, if you remember. A kuate. Hyper hearing, to listen with action. Keeps going. Second parable. And he was saying to them, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then mature grain in the head, but when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. You might be thinking, we already talked about sowing the seed, right? What was the focus of the parable of the sower? Soil and the conditions of the heart, right? What's the focus here? The growth of the seed, right? Again, what's the seed? The word of God. In seed form, what happens when it's sown? It goes down. And if it's good soil, what happens? It starts its process, right? Okay. If you're a grower, gardener, farmer, anything... No matter how good you are, how beautiful your garden might be, are there seeds that you planted that didn't grow? Yeah. Do you know why the seeds that did grow grew? Did you do the same thing to the soil with the seeds that didn't grow that did grow? Would you change anything to help the soil grow? 
be something where all the seeds grow? Can you? Even if you do everything right, there's going to be some seed that does not take root. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you have any control over the growing process? You may not understand how it works, but can you make it work? That's what this is saying right here. The farmer sows, or this man casts seed upon the soil. He goes to bed at night and gets up by day. And the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. It's pretty humbling. What is this parable saying? To me, immediately, it's saying, I need to know my place. I'll explain what I mean here in a moment, but... No matter how good you are at planting a garden or even harvesting it after it's grown, you have nothing to do with it growing. You could prepare the soil and you could reap the benefits, but the in-between part has nothing to do with you. It either grows or it doesn't. Either takes root or it doesn't. What's your job? But first, before you stay out of the way, what are you supposed to do? Plant. What's God's job? To grow. What do we pray? Let your kingdom come, that your will be done. Why do we pray it? Because we can't do it. Does that make sense? We pray for God's kingdom to come because we can't make God's kingdom come. We can't make God's will be done. We have to pray it because only God could bring God's kingdom. Only God can make his will happen. We can prepare, we can prepare the soil. We could plant the seed, but we have no impact on the growth. One, I hope that gives you a little bit of reprieve for those that are carrying the harvest on your shoulders. It's not yours to carry. Your job is to plant. To set your light before others. To put the gospel out in front of others in word and deed. To live your life in a way that points to Christ. That when they're ready to receive it, it takes its place in the soil. What happens in the soil is not up to you. Do you hear me? Parents, do you hear me? Nothing that you can do can guarantee that your children will believe. Nothing. But you still plant the seed. It is up to God to work the soil. It is up to God to grow and produce the fruit from that seed. Your job is to plant. Your job is to pray. Your job is to keep revealing the truth about God in your home. Keep praying. Keep presenting the gospel. Keep living your life authentically for God. Because again, trust me, as I said last week, your children are watching. Your grandchildren are watching. Is this a real faith or is it just something you put on during Sunday? Do you post about it over here but you're cussing someone else out over here? They're watching. But it is not your burden for them for the growth. I know it's a desire. And trust me, as a parent, it is a strong desire And my kids have their own faith. 
but it has to be their own. It has to be their own faith. We, there is nothing that we can do. You have no capacity in yourself whatsoever, none, none, to produce belief in your children. You have no ability to argue anyone into faith. Stop doing it. We are to have a defense for the faith of which was, or within us, but it doesn't mean that we're arguing with them. We're sharing the truth. And it's pretty easy, pretty early on, if that argument is just going to argue back and forth and never actually go anywhere. Because there's many people that want to argue with you that no matter how well you do in your presentation, they're never going to say yes unless God gets a hold of them. And they'll tell you. If I answer, I actually asked this question before. If I answer all of these questions that you have adequately, will you give your life to Christ? No. So I was done with the conversation. I prayed for them, but I was done with the conversation because it's not worth, you're, we're not going to argue people in because, again, what's the only way that we come to faith? Not by any intellect or anything like that, right? It's by the grace of God who reveals the truth within or to us. Quickens our heart to receive. Prepares the soil to take the seed. Nothing that we do. We pray. We present the gospel. It's up to God to produce the harvest. We need to know our place. Again, our place is to plant faithfully to sow, but just like this guy right here, we go to sleep, we get up, there's growth, and we don't know what happens. Is it immediate? In good soil, if you remember the other parable, in good soil, was it immediate? No, it's, it's a process. It's a gradual thing, right? First comes what? It says right here. It says first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head, but when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle before the harvest has come. There's this process. There's excitement in it. And every single point of growth, there's excitement. And if we are walking alongside people where we sown seed into them, or even if we didn't, if we just walk alongside people that have had seed sown in them, as part of our job as disciples, remember we are called to make disciples of all the nations, we are called to present the truth to them. And as we see growth, we need to celebrate. But it's not us doing it. This verse right here and amongst others are some of the reason I, I try to say and I usually try to make sure that I'm very clear on this is you never save anyone. No one in the history of the world other than Jesus Christ has saved anyone. They have presented the truth, but after that, if they receive that and come to salvation, it's not because of you. It's because of the work of the Holy Spirit within them. Because we have no control over the growth of the seed. None. Oh, but churches try. What happens if we're not seeing growth? We try to manufacture it. We want people to respond, right? It's first off, their first effort is to present some emotional message to draw on the heartstrings to try to get more people to come forward in an altar call. I've actually seen some altar calls where they're trying to pray over them and they didn't respond strong enough, so they push harder. We might come up with new programs or different things, which again, ministries are great, but no ministry that we do, no revival that's ever been held, no worship song that's ever been sung, ever 
makes someone come to salvation. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not saying that we don't have reasons to have ministries. We have ministries to present the gospel to others, to love on others, because we're called to love others and love God. Part of that loving on others is to present to them the truth, a place to learn for those that are Christians are right, to grow in their salvation, to work out their salvation daily in that way. And the truth, the ones that already have some growth, we do still do some weeding. There's some tending to the plants. There's some things like this. But we can't just water more because we don't see growth. I read somewhere that a lot of new gardeners, don't do this, water too much. They're not seeing growth, so they drown their plants in water because they're not seeing the growth, and that's what they think they need, and it's just they need patience and perseverance, and the seed needs to do what the seed needs to do. No ministry can ever be manipulated. We're we're not going to say, oh, you know what? We need a famous person to present the gospel. That's what's going to get people to respond. Churches do that, and they bring them in. Right? We need this ministry or that ministry to have the kingdom of God come. And nothing that we do will bring the kingdom of God quicker or faster or anything without the Holy Spirit being behind it. Do we have our role? Absolutely. Did God give you gifts and talents to share with others in ministry? Absolutely. Did God put a burden on your heart to minister to some that are in need in whatever capacity that is in or outside of the church? Absolutely. Do we need those ministries to happen? Yes. One, to give you a place to serve and to see God's miracles take place in front of you. Also to give us a place to pray, because we're called to pray, to be the body of Christ, we need to be together and lift each other up in prayer. And we also need a place to hear the answers to prayer. We need to give testimony to what God's doing. And those that are sitting amongst you right now, some, some of you may not have had that seed take root yet. But you had the gospel presented to you. And these ministry opportunities that we have in, throughout the week are opportunities for them to see the truth the light presented in front of them. None of it's going to make them come to salvation. But it's preparing the soil. It's sowing the seed. It's tending the garden. It's all needed, but we need to know our place that nothing that we do will make God's kingdom come. Who makes God's kingdom come? God. And we pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, not mine, not yours. And churches are driven by numbers, and we're, every pastor I talk to hates this in our reports. We have to report these numbers all the time, and numbers mean nothing in the big picture. Sounds weird, because yes, you need people to have numbers in there, but the numbers, of, there's, the numbers don't take into account spiritual growth within the people that are already here. The plant that keeps getting bigger and bigger and has more and more fruit on it, there's nothing that the numbers say about that. The numbers are just kind of like what evangelists use of, hey, 10,000 people heard the gospel and responded. Well, only about 2% of those stuck with it. If you talk to evangelists like Billy Graham, they know that. Let's keep going. Last one. And he said, How shall we picture the kingdom of God, or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are sown upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms a large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. What do we do with this? Mustard seed. Okay. Some people have completely abandoned the inerrancy of Scripture because of this passage. Because they're like, clearly the mustard seed is not the smallest seed. 
They, ser- they, give, they gave up everything they knew about truth because it's a lie. Well, as far as one, first off, you have to remember at the time when Jesus was saying this, teaching this, the idiom, mustard seeds were often used as the idiom for very insignificant, small thing. At that time, too, it was the smallest seed planted in the garden for purposes of growth. So is the smallest seed for purpose of gardening in that? And it's the smallest seed planted with the biggest impact, result. Mustard seeds can grow to 10 to 15, usually around 10, but 10 to 15 feet tall. Okay, it's not really a tree, so if your, your translation says tree, it's really kind of a plant in there. Um, And he's saying this to them again. How shall we picture this kingdom? Remember what I talked about earlier. What were the disciples thinking? They're thinking, are we it? Is this all there is to this kingdom movement of Jesus bringing in the kingdom of God with us? Like some of them are probably sitting there going like, I really didn't want to be here with any of you except for this guy, Jesus, that we're following. And now we're supposed to usher in the kingdom of God? They had their doubts for good reason. Because if it was up to them with that ragtag bunch of people, nothing was going to happen. Most of them actually would have been fighting, right? Especially Levi would have probably been the target of at least four of them, if not six of them. The zealots and the fishermen probably really did not like Levi. Look at this here. Mustard seed. Insignificant seed. When it takes root, though it's smaller than all the other seeds in the soil, when it is sown, it grows and becomes the larger of the garden plants. And if you talk to some people, especially in that region, about mustard seeds, is it a plant that they like? Kind of humble. When you talk about the kingdom of God, what kind of plant or tree would you probably use? I'm thinking cedar, right? The cedars of Lebanon, of just these stout trees that represent strong kingdoms, the oak tree, redwood trees, just these things that just present this awe in them. Jesus is presenting the gospel as a mustard plant that is not expected, that is unruly at times, that's a pain in the rest of the garden. If you don't take care of it, it could overtake the rest of the garden. So here it is. With this small group of disciples, the seed is being sown, the gospel is being presented, and he's saying that one day this small seed, this insignificant group of people, is going to get sown and grow so large that it becomes this unruly kind of difficult plant that people have to deal with. That kind of sounds right, right? If you look at Christianity in the world, it's become this kingdom beyond anything that the disciples could imagine. That this truth has been exposed and it expanded this kingdom from pole to pole, worldwide. It's this kingdom that is growing that people have to deal with. Now, some people have found benefits in its shade, right? Right? So the birds, remember, what did the birds represent in the other parable? Satan or his minions, right, or evilness. And in hermeneutics, which is a preachy word, hermeneutics is the study of gospel in exposit- it, when you're expository or ex- 
expositing, or when you're looking at Scripture, <laughs> there needs to be this expository consistency. If the soil meant the condition of the heart in one parable, it needs to mean the condition of the heart in the next. Otherwise, we could read into it anything that we want. So yes, it might look nice and say, oh, the birds take comfort in its branches. And that could be somewhat good that some of the, those in the nations, those that are evil, have found comfort in what the church provides the world. And maybe even have taken some rest in that and has heard the gospel and become part of the mustard tree, branch, plant. Could be. What I hear is a warning that this church is going to grow so large that birds, Satan's minions, could find their way into it and disrupt what's going on. That it's going to be so big, the branches out there could have the birds rest in it, and we might not even notice because we're so big at this point. And and I'm not saying anything about growth because, yes, I believe that When the Holy Spirit is behind it, growth in numbers is good. But if all you are about is growth in numbers, it's going to be very easy for those birds to find their place in your church. If all it is is about numbers, Satan will find his way into there and cause disruption in the church to distract you. Now, the big church globally, yes, there might be some things that the church does globally that others, non-believers, and the world in general has benefited from the covering of the church. But I really think that this is a warning that, hey, this gospel that you're presenting, it's going to be effective. It's going to be in the face of others. They're going to have to deal with it. It's going to be unexpecting, unruly, but it's also going to be a place for minions of Satan to hide. So be careful what you do with what you hear. So kind of come together now. Those who have ears, let them hear. What you do with what you hear matters. Hunger for the truth. Hunger for his righteousness. Desire for his kingdom to come, but you cannot make it come. You could plant the seed, live your life, trust God with it, and pray. Pray, pray, pray. We can't distort the seed. We can't take it out of the ground and massage it to help it grow better or water it more. No pastor anywhere can give life to Scripture. All that I can do and any pastor can be and do for Scripture is be its voice. Speak the truth. And pray. Father God, we we thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. We thank you for these pictures of your kingdom, as obscure as they may be. Lord, I thank you for your love and your grace in in bringing that gospel truth to, to me personally and for those that call upon your name. Lord, I pray that every single person here has heard the truth, heard the gospel, and has come to you. But I don't want to be disillusioned in that. There may be some in here today that have been walking with the church for a long time, but not with you. Lord, I pray that whatever it is that you do inside that soil, I pray that you would allow that seed, the gospel, to take root in their lives today. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us in ministry 
to not grow weary. Even when there's a few that are being ministered to or we only see a few benefiting, Lord, that you would remind us and empower us to keep sowing, to keep praying. Lord, I surrender every ministry that we have here at Bitterroot Valley Church to your authority, to your rule. Lord, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done. Lord, I praise you that we get to be a part of it, but that we don't make it happen. I thank you that that burden is not ours to carry. I pray for those that might have people in their lives that are struggling, Lord, that they are, they've planted the seed many, many, many times. I pray that they would just keep praying. That they would allow you to do what you do. That you would give them patience and perseverance to grow in you. Lord, I pray for those that are finding solace or a hiding place in the church that have a desire to destroy it. Lord, I pray that you would expose them. Lord, I pray that you would soften their hearts to receive your truth. Lord, I pray that you would protect your church. Lord, we love you. We commit ourselves to you now. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen.